Hey, good evening. Welcome to a Roger Stein Church on the Web. It's Sunday night. Uh, what a great four days it's been for Rising Shine Ministries, and uh, we just had a wonderful revival. It's been incredible. Uh, Brother Tim Brown, coming out of Grungy, Virginia, came down and really delivered the word. Uh, I was praying that you were able to at least watch it on Facebook. We streamed, we live streamed the second, third. A service and this morning at uh, the Way, the Truth, and the Life, they are live streamed on their page. So if you want to see, uh, I'll share that later. Uh, but if you want to see it, it's on their page. But we had an incredible movement of God. What an incredible time we had uh, in Latson, South Carolina, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at uh, the Chapel of the Holy Spirit, which is attached to WKCL Radio. We, we thank them. Uh, for giving us the space and and and, uh, and just their 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 the way they welcomed us and took care of us, we're so grateful for them and allowed uh, for that revival to take place. Uh, it's incredible what God can do if you get a bunch of people together, uh, going in the same direction, seeking the same thing, and uh, we had a very good time. Had good crowd uh, all three nights. Uh, I, I, I will say it could have been better. Uh, everybody knew we were doing it there, but revival is, uh, I'm learning slowly but surely, and I don't agree and I disagree greatly that it just seems like people don't have time for Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night church. They, uh, everybody has time to go to church on Sunday morning. Uh, it's in their DNA. It's in their calendar. They, they, they set their week up. Okay, I got to go to church on Sunday morning, but uh, when you throw something in there that's not uh, a normal thing for them. It just just seems like they, they don't want to come. Those of you that showed up, I know you had a great time. I know you were blessed in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, our Savior and Lord. But uh, it, it was just uh, started at 7 o'clock, which was a good time. I know some folks work. If you're working, you can't go. You're sick. I understand that. But if there's an opportunity for you to go hear a speaker uh, that's not your normal guy, you know, uh, that's bringing a fresh word, uh, I encourage you to do that. This will not be the only time this particular guy is in town. Uh, it will not be the only time that Arise and Shine Ministries has a revival. Uh, we, at My intention is to attack every single city. Uh, we, we, we attacked Latson this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We attacked Goose Creek this morning on Sunday. Uh, and, and my absolute intention is to get pastors on board, uh, churches on board that want to have a real live revival, a real revival, not just a pat you on the back of your head, you're doing okay revival, but a gut-wrenching, Holy Ghost-filled, make changes, the, a revival changes people. You should not go into a revival on Thursday and leave out on Saturday and be the same that you was on Wednesday. That is not revival. Revival changes people. It makes things better. It destroys change. It brings the Holy Spirit. It makes your tomorrow better than your yesterday. That's the purpose behind revivals. And uh, for one, Horizon Shine Ministries uh, and WKCL Television uh, is absolutely not done. We are in just beginning, and we will, uh, in fact, invade. I will use the word invade. We will invade every single city in the low country uh, with the help of the pastors and the churches in each city. And we're going to light this place up for, uh, for God. We're going to light this fire, and we're going to let it burn and bring back the term holy city to where it really means something. It's not just a catchphrase or a word. Uh, but bring back the term Holy City. Uh, and in, 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 on that same line tonight, I want to talk to you about things that churches in revival have. You see, the book of Acts gives the model of what an on-fire New Testament church should look like. All you got to do is look at the first couple of verses, first couple of chapters. It is the model of what a New Testament church needs to look like. Philip's revival at Samaria has four distinct signs of what should drive and characterize an awakening in our churches. And if, uh, if you want revival, then you have to look at the real deal. You have, to, you, have to, you, have, you have to model 
your, your, your revival after what really happened, after the real deal. Uh, just like if you, ha you, you, you have a business model, you're going to start a business, you're going you're gonna to start moving, you, you would take other businesses, you would look at their business model and see how it worked and, and then follow that, how that works. Uh, it would be silly for you to open a business, well, let's follow the business model of somebody that was in business for three and a half weeks. Or am I going to follow a business model of somebody that was in business for 2,000 years? Or, or am I going to, uh, 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 this, this business model, people were, people were the, the applications were this high to go to work for this business because they were, they were truly a good business. Or I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to follow the business model of somebody that's got three employees and can't keep them working. So revival's the same way. So we must follow a revival that works. So tonight I want to just start with, if we'll get through it, we won't, we won't. But uh, four things that a church in revival will have not might have not should have but they absolutely will have our text tonight is acts chapter 8 i'm going to read uh, a lot of verses uh, just to start out with uh, we're going to be in acts 8 verses 5 through 20 5 through 20 uh, but let me tell you a little story first i recently heard about a lady and i'm not going to tell you about what color her hair was she went into a napa auto parts store she was asked uh, she asked the attendants for a 710 cap the employees all looked at each other and saying, what is a 710 cap? And she says, you know, it's right on the engine. Mine got lost somehow. And um, uh, where am I? I lost my place. My little computer plashes up when people say stuff. He says, um, what is a 710 cap? She says, you know, it's right on the engine. Mine got lost somehow and I need a new one. Well, what kind of car is, on it? is it on? They asked. Uh, perhaps it was an old Datsun 710, but no, she said, it's a Buick. Okay, lady, how big is it? And she makes a circle with her hands about three and a half inches in diameter. What does it do, they asked. She says, I don't know, but it's always been there. She grabbed a sheet of scratch paper and drew a picture of it. The guys behind the counter are looking at it upside down as she writes it, and they've just fall down behind the counter because they are laughing so hard. One guy finally says, I think you want an oil cap. She says, yeah, 710 cap, oil cap. I don't know, I don't care what you call it, I just know I need one. And I don't see what's so funny about it. And the, the people looked at it, they turned the paper around and the, and the word oil upside down looks like 710. And so that's what she was doing. Uh, it was funny when I read it the first time. I hope you enjoyed it. Amen. Look at verse uh, cha uh, Acts chapter 8. I'm sorry, I'm going to start in verse 4 and not 5. So Acts chapter 8, verse 4. It says, Therefore those who scattered went everywhere preaching the word. That's a key. The reason I added 4 is because that's important. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miracles which he did, they listened in unity to what he said. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in the city. Now a man named Simon was previously in the city practicing sorcery and astonishing the nation of Samaria, saying he was someone great to whom they all listened, uh, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is a great power of God. Excuse me. They listened to him because for a long time he had astonished them by his sorcery. But when they believed Philip preaching about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Even Simon himself believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed as he watched the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they came down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For still he had come on none of them. Uh, they were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When they laid their hands on them, they, and they received the Holy Spirit, when Simon, then they laid their hands on them, uh, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that 
through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power uh, that whomever I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, Peter said to him, May your money perish with you because you thought you could purchase the gift of God with money. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this story. I thank you for the book of Acts. I thank you for the first church of Jesus Christ and the power that it brought to us, Lord God. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. I pray you would open our ears and our eyes that as we go through, Father God, we realize what it is to have real revival and those things that we will see, not should see, not could see, but we will see if we are truly in a heart of revival. In Jesus' name, pour it out in the low country, Lord God, and allow us to take it to all the parts of the United States of America and to the world. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want you to notice first that the persecution that was designed to exterminate the church was turned by God into a vehicle for its revival and its enlargement. The persecution that was designed to exterminate the church was turned around by God, and it became a vehicle for revival and enlargement. I probably could pray now and close this message out, because that is a statement that where we are, it is uh, it's July the 18th, 2021. We are slap in the middle of that statement, my friend. The persecution, the COVID-19, the people that are attacking the church, They've been going through this for all this long time. And God himself has turned that situation into an opportunity to reach people that would never, ever darken the doors of a church. But they will sit at their house. They will watch online. Somebody will click to a message online because they're sitting at home in their pajamas. We are reaching more people through this social media than we would ever have reached. Because see, when you go into a church and you ask you got 250 people in there. It says, everybody saved, 250 hands goes up. Whether they're saved or not, everybody raises their hand that they're saved because they don't want to be the one person that else. Did you see that guy? He didn't raise his hand. But a lot of people, church people, go to church. Okay? The lost, they don't necessarily go to church. They go to church on Easter. They go to church on Christmas. They may go to church if their grandmother invites them for the birthday or something like that. But the lost people don't go to church. And so now, now they do, we do get them in there, you get invited, but the vast majority don't. So now we have this social media because of COVID-19. The, there's every, All the churches are live streaming their church services because of COVID-19. I'm telling you, we didn't have a big meeting. All the pastors of the United States met together and said, Hey guys, we need to live stream our church services. That's not what happened. What happened was the devil sent COVID-19 into our country, into the United States, and into our world. And we were forced by the government to close our churches down and we turned that around and we went to social media and so now every single church that i know is streaming their church services live on social media the persecution that was designed to exterminate this church in 2021 to, de to design to exterminate our church god has turned that persecution around and we are now reaching people what an opportunity. What an opportunity. The, the, the scattered Christians back in, this, in, our, in our story, they went everywhere. And they went everywhere preaching the word. They did not go everywhere cowering down. Uh, oh, I got this going on. I got this going on. All these things are going on. The government's doing this. And we can't speak of Jesus. They say you can't say Jesus here. And, and, and they, so they, they, oh, I love your Lord, but I'm still cowering away. They went preaching the word of God. They didn't hide out in fear. They went everywhere, even to those places they had been forbidden to go earlier in, in the Gospels. They went everywhere. Philip chose the metropolis of Samaria, the, which is the formal rival capital of the northern ten tribes where 14 kings reigned over 200 years. And what happened when Philip went there? God sent a great revival because Philip was determined to speak 
the Word of God. He was determined to talk about Jesus Christ. He was not satisfied with whining and complaining about all the persecution he's been going through, about everything he has to deal with, and, and, and he had to move, and he had to do this, and he's got to wear a mask, or he's got to wear a face mask, or he's got to wear gloves. He was not satisfied with doing that. He simply spoke about Jesus. That is the that's the key my friend he spoke about Jesus so tonight and maybe for the next week or so I, I if we get through these four things tonight then we'll move on but if we don't we'll we'll be here again tomorrow night but I want to look at four things a church in revival will have now you're gonna have some of these things if you're not in revival I mean a, a blind hog finds a root every now and again my friend okay so the, it's, some of these things are gonna happen in spite of of where we are because God still is in the business of saving his children he's still in the business of healing the sick he's still in the business of pouring out the spirit he, he that's his that's what he does he's still in the business of taking care of us providing for us protecting us that's it that's what he does to the children he loves but some of these things you're not going to see unless you are actually actively in pursuit of revival number one Christ is preached Christ is preach my friend what are you and your church lifting up what are you hearing every Sunday morning is it Christ and salvation through Jesus Christ healing through the power of Jesus Christ's name healing because of his sacrifice on Calvary because by his wounds we are healed or are we talking yeah Jesus is here but you got all these other things you got to be worried about you see in this revival in Acts Christ is preached. Many preachers themselves some man uh, preach some man-made doctrine or the wrong things as the answers to people's problems. And Philip, Philip pointed them out to Christ. Philip said, I know you got problems and I know you can do this, but Jesus Christ is the answer to what's going on in your life. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't get caught up in theology. He didn't get sidetracked by attacking certain sins. This one's worse than, oh, you're all right. That ain't such a bad sin. Just imagine what this guy's doing. You know, he, that wasn't it. Instead, he led people straight to the answer, straight to the, to the solution. He led them to Jesus Christ. It's, the, it's only the preaching of Christ that can set men free. Whew, glory. I, I know I can't hear y'all say amen, but I know somebody said amen right there. It's only the preaching of Christ that can set men free. Listen, if, if you've got preachers that are talking, well, i got this Christian psychologist, you know, you need to go see them. You need to go see Jesus Christ and let him set you free. Now, if you need to talk to somebody, that's okay. I agree. Christian psychology is certainly better than a non-Christian psychologist. But that, that can't be the solution to your problem. The solution to your problem is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we need to preach that. It is only preaching of Christ that can set man free. It's the only the preaching of Christ that can revolutionize a person's life and change their base nature. It changes the inner workings of your body and your mind. It doesn't work on the outside. You know, I'm gonna, I'll probably get in trouble here right now, but I, I, you know, there's some women out there, they spend millions of dollars a year on makeup and they look beautiful. But Lord, they will not under any circumstances allow you to see them for they spend two and a half hours at their makeup table hiding the base nature, hiding their self, hiding the beauty that God gave them. Now, I'm not picking on you. You like makeup, that's fine. I'm okay with it. I, that's not what this is about. I, will, I hope that you understand where I'm getting at. When we keep putting Band-Aids on stuff, we just keep pouring molasses on, 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 on ant beds and stuff. They're all up in there and they're having a good time. Band-Aids don't work. You need a cure. And the cure is Jesus Christ and the preaching of Christ because it changes you from the inside out. It's making them desire. It makes you desire, if you would, to live for God, to be where Christ is, to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, to wake up in the morning and read the word and pray. So what do we say about Christ? 
Here's what Philip said. Philip said, proclaim Christ. He determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. 2 Corinthians 2 and 2 says, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the story, my friend. That's the story. The word proclaim here is, is, is caruso. It isn't a word for evangelize, but it's to be a herald. To announce the kingship of Christ. His king, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So when we proclaim, we are announcing the kingship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what, that's what Philip was doing. He wasn't beating around the bush. He said, this is it. Christ, no Christ, and him crucified. Jesus is eternal. He, is, he coexists with the Father, the Creator. He was born of a virgin, and we need to declare his sinless life. We need to declare his miracles. We need to declare his atoning death, his resurrection, and his ascension. Because when we do that, people get saved. And when they get saved, they get healed, and their life changes. It's so important that we quit babysitting and start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hate going into churches, and I had a big, long service. I, I, got, I got three songs. We're going to sing three songs. We're going to take up an offering. I'm going to preach for 25 minutes, and we're going to say, have a good day. I'll see you next week. That's babysitting, my friend. That's babysitting. Let the Holy Spirit control the services. Preach the gospel. If it takes you five minutes, it takes five minutes. If it takes 25 minutes, it takes 25 minutes. If you're there for three hours because people are all over the altar receiving healing from God, then it takes three hours. It's just a fact. Whatever it takes, you got to do it. He's the only Savior. That's in Acts 12, uh, 4 and 12 and John 14 and 6. There's a guy, David Platt, told about going to Hindu temple and asking the Hindus how they get to heaven. And David summarized their view for asking uh, for them in asking if they thought it was like a mountain with many paths that led to God. And they said, yes, that is what we think. Then David said, what if I told you that we can't get to him by any, other, any of those paths, but instead God came down the mountain to get to us. My friend, that is what Christianity is. All other religions are attempts to get to God. All other, all these other make you feel good, twinkle your ears, make you, you know, uh, pat you on the back of the head. Those are attempts to reach God. Christianity is God reaching us. He came to us. He came because he sent his son because he loved us. Jesus overthrew the powers of hell. He took our transgressions away nailing them to his cross, which he did, I might add, voluntarily. He made peace between us and the Father. He made peace between us and the Father. So the first thing is we must do is we must preach Christ. Crucified, beaten, raised on the third day, and now sitting at the right hand of God. We must preach Christ. The second thing that churches in revival have is the people are hungry. The people are hungry. I don't know how many churches you've gone to that you go there and they sing their three songs, they take up the offering, you get one, maybe two. At the outside, three people will say amen. Preacher says amen, and they, they're like somebody sucked the, 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 the oxygen out of the building. They're leaving so fast to get in their car so they can get to the restaurant so they can eat before anybody else gets there. That's not hunger. That's, that's religion, my friend. I went to church on Sunday. Yeah, what happened? I don't know. I just went there. I heard three songs. I don't know what they were. Some guy preached, and I went and got something to eat at the Cracker Barrel. That's religion, my friend. But, but when you're in revival, when, when the Holy Spirit is guiding your church, and when you're making a difference in the world, when you're making a difference in Latson or in Charleston or in Somerville or in Goose Creek or in Hanahan or, or Johns Island, James Island, when you're making a difference in them places, people are hungry. And there's very different reactions to God. So another sign of revival is hunger. 
Revival means increased spiritual interest or restoration of vital signs or the resuscitation of a person. What we're trying to do here, Arise and Shine Ministries is dedicated and devoted to preach and revival. We want to reach, we want to revitalize the, the, the vital signs of our churches in the low country. We want to resuscitate our people that when you walk into church and they're, they're doing some great music, some worship music, you got people got their hands in their pockets. They, they can't even get their hands above their waist, much less above their head. They're just going there because that's what they're supposed to do. We want to resuscitate the body of Christ through revival. People respond in, in different ways to the gospel. In Athens, they mocked the gospel. In Derby, they were cooled toward it. But in Antioch, in Presidia, they were eager and hungry for it. You see, they came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Look at Acts 13 and 44. 13 and 44. This is the end of a long story. They were preaching. They were teaching. Some people came. They went and told some other people. And by the end, this is what Acts 13, 44 says. On the next Sabbath, when they began to teach about Christ, almost the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. See, I want somebody to come to church to hear the word of God. I could care less if you hear me. I like to tell stories. I like to make people laugh. That's just who I am. But more importantly, I want, when you walk out the door at 12.30 or 2.30 or however long we're there, I want you to be able to say, man, I heard about God today. I heard about Christ today. The Holy Spirit spoke to me today. I was released. I was, the chains fell off of me today. I received Jesus as my personal Savior. Oh, yeah, what the preacher said. He just said, Jesus loves me. I don't, I don't care if you know my message all this stuff that I'm adding to my message, I want you to get the point. The point is Jesus Christ crucified, raised the third day, and now sitting at the right hand of the Father. And that is the only way you can revitalize or, or re, rekindle your relationship with God, if you would. In Beretha, they studied the word daily to see whether those things in, uh, were so. That's in Acts 17 and 11. They studied. No, yeah, they went to church. They went to the, 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 to the chapel or, to, or to, their, to their meetings, but then they studied the Word of God. They didn't rely on one guy standing up there with, a, with a, a coat and a tie on to lead and guide them down the whole wide world. They studied their self. Everybody has one of these, or you should have one of these. If you ain't got one, by all means, let me know. We'll get you one and read it. I mean, they studied. To, why? Because they wanted to know if what was happening was in fact true. Our attitude toward the Word determines what we will receive from it. If your idea of Bible study is your Sunday morning church service or even a Wednesday night church, it's the two times, when do, you, when do you read your Bible, Wednesday and Sunday? Oh, that's it? Yeah, oh yeah, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm all in, man. I'm a Jesus freak. I, I'm, I'm loving God. Well, I'll tell you, yeah, Wednesday night I go to Bible study, and Sunday night I go to, or Sunday morning I go to church. Hey, how about coming to a revival? Well, if it ain't Wednesday or Sunday, I ain't going. That's exactly what we're dealing with, my friend. That's why we where we are. That's why we are where we are. Because the devil's out there just beating us to pieces. But your attitude toward the word determines, is determined by how you receive it. Changing someone else. I like this story. In Charles Schultz's cartoon, Peanuts, Lucy was saying that if she was in charge of the world, she'd change everything. And Charlie says, that wouldn't be easy. Where would you start? Lucy looked directly at him, pointed her finger and said, I'd start with you. You want to change the world? Look in the mirror, point your finger and say, I'm changing you. I'm starting with you. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to pray. I'm going to spend time with the Lord. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to let the word of God get into my spirit. I'm going to be the one that's going to ignite the fire that's going to bring my neighborhood to revival or my my family or my workplace or my schoolroom. Look at yourself in the mirror. 
like Lucy said, I'm starting with you. We need to quit pointing out everybody else's faults, everybody else's problems. We need to start concentrating on how we can change ourselves. We change ourselves by studying the Word of God, having a relationship with Jesus Christ, which forms a relationship with His Father God, our Father God, which allows Him to pour into us His Spirit, which brings us to the next level. Our preacher, uh, the anointing on him was incredible. The anointing on him was incredible this week. I mean, on Thursday night, he had a message in his, in, his, in his head. He was ready to preach. He had studied, and he was ready to go. And something happened in the church, and it changed. The anointing fell, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him, and he changed the whole thing. And at the end, people were all over the altar. It was just, that's how it works, because he had a relationship with Father God. And you have that relationship by, by getting into the Word, getting into the Word. There's some elements of spiritual hunger. I want to give you them, and that's probably going to be it for tonight. Uh, they didn't hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. That's a scripture right there. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled with it. You will receive it. Number one, our desire is important. God says, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29 11 said, we must desire God. Have a longing, a craving for God. Have a longing and a craving for God. Our desire is important, my friend. Number two, if you're spiritual hunger, if you're spiritually hunger, you'll go to the Word of God. If you're seeking about Jesus, go to where it is that you can find Him. And listen, if you wanted to be a mathematician, then you would study math. If you wanted to be a, a space shuttle pilot or a, a scientist that studies space, you would study space. A meteorologist studies weather, studies all those things, because they want to be the best meteorologist that they can be. If you want to be the best disciple of Jesus Christ, study Jesus Christ. Take his textbook, which is the Bible, and study that. Go to the Word of God. A person can't, can't say they're hungry for God if they're not getting into the Word. I know I've said that 10 times tonight. That's how important the Word of God is. The very Word of God can heal you from cancer. You don't believe me. I'm going to tell you again. The very Word of God can heal you from cancer. Can heal you from, it can, it can make the blind eye see, the deaf raise. Jesus said, call them, come forth. Jesus used the Word of God a lot. It's the Word of God that does these things. And you got to know it. You got to study it. You got to have it. Today's world, 2021, it's right in Google. Even Google knows the Word of God. You don't think I'm serious? Just type a couple of words or something you're looking for, and Google bring it right up. It's important. Number three, a person who's spiritually hungry will be willing to make certain sacrifices. Now somebody, I'm going to lose some people right here. A person who's spiritually hungry will be willing to make certain sacrifices. They'll sacrifice anything, anything that stands between them and and God. And my friend, sin stands between you and God. So when you get saved, uh, this is my next one anyway, um, number, number four is friends who are bad influences will be sidelined. When you change inside of you, you can't hang out with the same people. You just can't. They don't care about your insides. They only care about themselves and what you guys do together. I have a friend of mine that, that he, he loves football. He's told me this story several times years and years ago. Uh, but when he came to know Jesus, because every Sunday they would have a party at some, one of the houses, and it would be a football party, and they'd be drinking and all this harousing, growing around and everything. And, 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 and he received Jesus as his personal Savior, and it was real to him. He was serious. And the next Sunday morning, he was on his way to church. Well, the next week, they called him up and said, hey, we're having this, this party over the house, football time, come on. He simply told them, I can't come. 
What do you mean you can't come? He said, no, I received Jesus as my personal Savior. I'm saved. I'm a different person. And they immediately went crazy. They said, oh, no, you got to come. You got to come. We miss you. We miss you. Because the devil wants to pull you back in. Remember that movie uh, with the mafia? You know, every time I get out, they pull me back in. That's what the devil wants to do. You have to separate yourself from the old life and move into your new life, your new life with Jesus Christ, your new life without sin, your new life without doing stupid stuff, your new life with Jesus, your new life with the Word of God, your new life with praying with people, with going to church, with seeking revival, with seeking the Holy Spirit, the new life that will change you forever. And sadly, not sadly, greatly, some of your old friends got to go. They got to go. Listen, drug addicts, you can't hang out with drug addicts. I don't care who you are. You ain't strong enough. You are not strong enough. The devil roars and moves around like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour. He only needs a little opening to get in. Alcoholics. They say an alcoholic's anonymous. Once you're an alcoholic, you can never drink. Every single alcoholic that's recovering will tell you those words. I'm an alcoholic and I cannot drink. Because they're relying on the world system. But that's okay. You know what? Once you move into a sinless life with Jesus Christ, you cannot go back to the other one. Amen. Number five. If you're spiritually hungry, you won't be satisfied with just enough. You see, real hunger can't get enough. When you're really hungry. I, I'm terrible. I love to eat. And... and and certain things I love to eat a lot. I'm a big fan of lasagna. I love a well-made lasagna. And my intentions would be to go get a little bit like that and be, be good. But as soon as I finish that little plate, I'm right back up there. I'm getting some more. Chicken salad. I love chicken salad. I'm going to make me a little bit. I end up with a big old bunch like that. So, so if you do your spirituality the same way, if you're spiritually hungry... You're not just satisfied with Sunday morning service. It may be the best service in the world. You may have the best pastor in the entire world. And, and that's fine. That, that's okay. But that should not satisfy you. A Sunday morning hour and a half message should not satisfy you. There's no way. Listen, find you a life group that meets during the week. Find you a, a, a that have Wednesday night service. Maybe Sunday. Not a lot of Sunday night services going on right now. All right, but now we're zooming uh, Bible studies, you know, because if you're really hungry for the Spirit of God, if you're really hungry for a new life, if you're really hungry for revival in the Low Country, one day a week won't do it. You will be sickened to death, as I was sickened. That we, you can't find a church to go to. Nobody's having revival. Nobody's having revival. Their idea of revival is they bring a speaker in for their Sunday morning service. That's not revival. That's religion. If you're spiritually hungry, you won't be satisfied with one service a week. If we're satisfied, it's a sign that either we've been filled with something else or we've settled for religion. I, I, that's enough said with that one. Number seven, hunger is a sign of your health. A person who's not hungry is sick. Poor diet, lack of exercise, depression, or sickness. Lack of spiritual hunger is a sign that there's something wrong in our lives. You know, that's the first thing people have. You go to the doctor, I haven't felt good for a while. Well, how you eating? Well, I ain't eating so good because when I eat, my stomach gets upset. Right? Because you don't feel good. You're sick. Spiritual hunger is the same way. If you're spiritually hungry, there's something going on. You're not in the Word of God long enough. You're not praying. You're not focusing on Jesus Christ. The very first thing we talked about is focusing on Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to get your hunger back. Whatever you focus on will cause a hunger for that thing to be developed. God will always meet us on the level of our hunger for Him. He's prepared to meet you if you are prepared to seek Him. Hunger is what attracts God to us like nothing else can. 
You know, if you spend time on your knees in, in worshiping and praising God, He is loving that. He is coming to your aid. He is sending the angels around to protect you and guide you. He is speaking to you. He's sending the Holy Spirit to guide and direct you and speak to you. The more the hungrier you are, the closer He gets. You see, hunger is developed by making time to spend with God in prayer, in reading the Word and in meeting with God's people to worship. Stop telling me that ah, the, the building's not the church. I'm so sick of hearing that that I'm about to puke. That is so wrong. The Bible says they met together. They went from house to house and they met together and they took care of each other's needs and they worshiped God and they prayed and they sought the Holy Spirit together. Now, we're on Facebook. I'm on Facebook right now because, what I say before, what the devil meant for evil, God has turned it around. And I'm able to come into your house right now and speak to you on Facebook. But that does not, will not, should not, never will replace fellowshipping together with like believers. Because for one thing, you may be going through something that somebody else has been through, and they can come alongside you and they can help you with that. There's nothing better than a face-to-face -face meeting with somebody that's an, in love with Jesus Christ, like you are in love with Jesus Christ. And that's what revival is about. Revival is about God's children coming together and with one, one purpose, one purpose. That's worshiping Jesus Christ, His Son. That's worshiping God. That's seeking deliverance. That's seeking healing. That's seeking a special touch and going in the same direction and lighting the world up on fire for Jesus Christ. That's what revival's about. I encourage you to get hungry. I encourage you to go... Uh, we're, we're done for tonight. I'm already over, but um, we'll do three and four next week. But I, listen, I hope that you will join with me and with the Rise and Shine Ministries to finally stand. So, you know, enough is enough. We no longer need a religious service on Sunday morning. We need a revival. We need to, to fan the flames of the fire of the Holy Spirit so that it burns brightly in the low country so that the, the International Space Station can say, man, there's something going on down there because there's some fire going There's something going on down there. And it gets goes wild and grows out from the low country. We need to do that. And I promise you, I promise you, God will honor your hunger. You will honor your devotion, your dedication to revival. Rest assured, there will be another opportunity very soon for you to attend a revival. I don't know what the speak. I don't know who the speaker's going to be. God ain't told me yet. All right, but I know that there's people out there that are on the same uh, marker that I'm on. They're on the same level that I am. They understand that it's time for us to step up and get up. It's time for us to call God in and just declare His goodness, His greatness, His miracles, His power to the world. And stop sitting on our couches under on our hands. Oh, these people are doing that. And these people are doing that. Government's doing that. Republicans are doing that. Democrats are doing that. Shut up and seek God. Because when God's in control and in charge, everything works together for the good for those who love God, amen, and are called according to his, his word. Hallelujah. Listen, thank you. I'm sorry I went over a little bit tonight, but I was, I was preaching just a little bit. Listen, Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And he is ready, willing, and able to pour out the fires of the Holy Spirit that will ignite you, your family, your life, your job. Tomorrow morning, you can wake up a different person. I promise. If you're looking for something, God will give it to you. I'm going to pray with you and let you go. Father, I love you so much. Thank you for the word. Thank you for revival, Father God. Thank you, Lord, that you want us in revival. It is your desire that we revive ourselves to seek you more and that you will pour into us those things that we desire. 
Go with us tonight, Father God. I pray blessings over everybody that is watching, everybody that sees this, for, for you are their God, and you love them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can contact me at AriseAndShineAmerica.com. Right? Yeah, Arise and Shine America. No, no, wait. Arise and Shine America at gmail.com. Excuse me. Or text me at 843-754-3509. I'd love to talk to you about revival. If you're a pastor or you got a pastor and you're looking for a revival in your church, please email us or call me. And I promise you we will begin the process to bring an evangelist in here uh, that will blow your socks off, that will bring the Holy Spirit, and will set your church on a new line to being closer to God. God bless, and have a wonderful night.